Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Drew Crawford, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of the Duke Journal of Comparative International Law. And on behalf of the journal, I welcome you all to our annual symposium. Before getting started, I just want to briefly mention that this is a particularly exciting year for our journal because we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. What originally started as the Duke Comparative and International Law Annual is now the Duke Journal of Comparative and International Law. And thanks to many hardworking staffs and excellent faculty advisors, in 20 short years, we've become one of the most highly regarded journals in the field. And so I'm particularly pleased uh, to have such a fascinating and timely topic with so many outstanding panelists to mark our 20th year in publication. So thank you all. War bound by law. Non-state actors in the law of armed conflict in the 21st century is today's topic. Some of the most visible threats to national and international security, and perhaps the most challenging, come from non-state actors. This is not a recent development, but the September 11 tax, attacks have certainly brought into clearer focus the level of complexity and the stakes involved with dealing with these threats. Given that the Geneva Conventions were written from a post-World War II state versus state warfare uh, perspective, how can or should the current law of war framework respond to evolving terrorism threats? There are conceptual gaps between domestic and international counterterrorism law. How should these be addressed? States have to act quickly to respond to terrorist threats. What are the procedural obligations of states engaged in asymmetric warfare? What rights and procedures are owed to detainees? What can be learned by comparing the US military commissions with terrorist trials in European countries? Is the treatment of non-state actors part of real law? Can it be, or is it just politics? These questions admit no easy answers, but fortunately, we have with us some of the leading experts in the field to learn from and to discuss how to approach these issues. So without taking any more time, I'll hand the, symposi the uh, podium over to our symposium editor, David Russo, to introduce the moderator of our first panel. Thank you. Good morning, and we thank everyone for being here, audience as well as participants. The first panel will be addressing procedure, detention, and policy. The moderator of the panel will be Professor Alexander Downs from the Duke Department of Political Science. This year at our symposium, we were hoping to gain a more interdisciplinary perspective. We're hoping um, and we're grateful for Dr. Downs' presence here. Dr. Downs holds a PhD from the University of Chicago and specializes in international security. His key research interests include uh, civilian victimization and warfare, published a book on civilian targeting in 2008, and he's held fellowships at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, as well as the Allen Institute for Strategic Studies at Harvard University, and at the Center for International and Strategic Cooperation at Stanford University. Thank you very much, Professor Downs. Well, thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today uh, to discuss this really important and timely issue. Uh, the, the bios of all the speakers today are in your program. I wanted to point that out. But uh, just before we get going, I wanted to hit a few of the high points uh, before we go to uh, our first speaker. So uh, the panel today, uh, our first speaker will be Derek Jinks. Uh, he is the Mars McLean Professor in Law at the University of Texas School of Law. He's also a senior fellow there at the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Uh, but this year he's based in Newport, Rhode Island at the uh, uh, U.S. Naval War College where he's the Charles H. Stockton Professor of International Law. Um, he's held a number of, of positions. Uh, he's been a member of the U.S. Secretary of State's uh, Advisory Committee on International Law since 2006, and he's worked in the, uh, the uh, uh, Prosecutor's Office at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, he's written extensively on the question of how international law influences states to improve uh, their human rights records. For example, his uh, uh, piece, Incomplete Internalization and Compliance with Human Rights Law, um, whether states are coerced or persuaded or cultured to, uh, to comply with international law. Uh, he's written a variety 
uh, of other articles on the applicability of the Geneva Conventions to the global war on terrorism. Uh, and I actually think his bio understates uh, his prolificness as a writer. Uh, by my count on his CV, he has four books, not just two books, uh, forthcoming this year. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, uh, among them are uh, International Humanitarian Law uh, and the Rules of War, the Geneva Conventions in an Age of Terror. Um, many of you probably know uh, Professor Madeline Morris uh, from the law school here at Duke University. Uh, She's held many positions uh, and consultancies. She's also served on the advisory committee uh, on international law to the Secretary of State uh, as chief counsel to the Office of Chief uh, Defense Counsel and the Office of Military Commissions in the Department of State, excuse me, the Department of Defense, and senior legal counsel, Office of the Prosecutor of the Court for Sierra Leone, also as a special advisor to the Prosecutor of the Republic of Serbia. Um, she's uh, been a consultant and a petitioner on a variety of cases, uh, uh, Boumedien versus Bush, an expert witness in many high-profile uh, cases. Uh, she founded the, the uh, Guantanamo Defense Clinic here at the law school and is also the director. She's written extensively on detention and trial of terror suspects, and her book, Terror and Integrity, Preventive Detention in the Age of Jihad, is forthcoming uh, this year from Oxford. And then finally, Matthew Waxman uh, is Associate Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, uh, formerly served as Principal uh, Deputy Director of Policy Planning uh, and Acting Director of Policy Planning at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs uh, and worked uh, with the National Security Council. Uh, he is, of course, best known to those of us in the political science side of things from his work with Dan Byman on uh, the Dynamics of Coercion, a book they co-authored together, and an article on strategic bombing, the Kosovo and the Great uh, Air Power Debate in International Security. But he's also written uh, on uh, intervention to stop genocide and mass atrocities, uh, and many articles uh, on, on detention policy, uh, detention as targeting, uh, and the use of force against states that might have weapons of mass destruction. Um, He's also an adjunct uh, fellow, senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a member of the Hoover Institute Task Force on National Security and Law. So we have uh, quite distinguished panelists. Uh, and they're each going to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes uh, on, uh, on the question of detention and policy. And uh, I look forward to hearing what they have to say. And we'll start with Professor Jenks. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, to start off our discussion of uh, issues of procedure, detention, and, and policy, uh, I thought to outline a few of the potentially relevant uh, legal frameworks in the law of armed conflict, schemes uh, under which individuals might be detained, uh, the procedures that are required in those schemes, uh, the duration for which detention is authorized in those schemes or contemplated in those schemes, and then just say just a word about the treatment that's required in each scheme. Uh, I want to do that pretty quickly because uh, really the heart of my remarks uh, will be a few comments I'll offer at the end about the relationship between these schemes, how we ought to think about them uh, in fashioning uh, a, a, a detention framework that's consistent with the law of armed conflict, but at the same time consistent to uh, other principles that we might think important and, in fact, under-protected uh, by the law of armed conflict, a, a point that will become clearer as I go forward. So a few frameworks. Uh, first, the framework that most of us are familiar with, at least by name, uh, and that's the prisoner of war framework. Uh, persons may be detained as prisoners of war. Uh, this framework is uh, provided in great detail, outlined in great detail, uh, in the third Geneva Convention of 1949. Uh, what category of persons may be detained? The category actually is fairly broad um, and defined in Article 4 of the Third Geneva Convention. We think traditionally of POWs as members of the armed forces of the, of, uh, the opposing side uh, in an international armed conflict, and that certainly is true. But the category includes uh, many other groups of individuals, so persons who are accompanying the armed forces of a state, in the field providing logistical support, civilians who are part of aircraft crews, uh, even war correspondents who are, who are authorized to accompany um, armed forces in the field, uh, 
are entitled to POW protection if captured by the other side. These persons are detainable by the plain terms of the Third Geneva Convention. It's quite a broad category, uh, and it includes, and this I want to underscore multiple times, it includes individuals who are fighters for non-state groups. So non-state actors are expressly included in the category of POWs in some circumstances. So POW, non-state actors who are part of or uh, who, who are part of or who are supporting um, uh, act on behalf of state armed forces may be entitled to POW protection provided that they meet uh, the nexus requirements and provided that they meet the behavioral and organizational requirements identified in Article 4. I don't want to go into too much detail about what those requirements are. The point is there are circumstances in which fighters who belong only to non-state armed groups may in fact be entitled to POW status if they have the right relationship to a state in an international armed conflict and if they meet the behavioral and organizational requirements. Fairly broad set of persons um, entitled to POW status but at the same time detainable as POWs. What procedures are required? None. Uh, there are no procedures required by the Third Convention uh, in order to establish that individuals are detainable as POWs. Article 5 of the Third Convention, widely discussed as a, an important procedural requirement in the Third Convention, does not require any hearing to be held in order to determine whether an individual may be detained as a POW. The provision requires only that individuals uh, be treated as POWs unless or until they are stripped of that status via a hearing before a competent tribunal, and then only in circumstances in which their status is in doubt. So the idea is persons if they're treated as POWs, are detainable as POWs without any procedure. Procedure is required only if you want to strip individuals of their status as POWs. So procedure, yes, but procedure incident to detention, no. For how long may these persons be detained? These persons may be detained until the end of active hostilities. Now, I want to note um, before moving on to the next framework. Um, this framework applies only in the context of an international armed conflict. Even if the framework extends to non-state actors, those non-state actors must be individuals who are participating in one way or another in an international armed conflict. The group for which they fight must bear uh, a, a certain relationship to a state that is a party to an international armed conflict. So, it must be that there is a more traditional armed conflict between two states at the heart of the matter in order to trigger the application of the Third Convention. So even if this framework isn't directly relevant uh, in the vast majority of conflicts between non-state actors or between states and non-state actors, uh, the framework may provide a model that we could draw on in fashioning uh, a detention framework moving forward. Second, potentially relevant framework. And, and this story so far isn't a terrifically optimistic one, if we're really interested. You, you may have noticed. Uh, if we're interested in building uh, a viable uh, detention framework for a long-term conflict with a diffuse non-state actor. Second potentially relevant framework. The Civilian uh, Convention, uh, the Fourth Geneva Convention, persons may be detained as civilians under that convention. Who may be detained? Well, first of all, it's important to note um, who it is that might qualify as civilians under the Fourth Convention. The definition is breathtakingly broad. Uh, it really is any person, other than some nationality requirements, nationality restrictions, the idea at bottom is any person who's made subject to the authority of the enemy in time of armed conflict uh, qualifies as a civilian if they aren't entitled to some more robust set of protections in the law of armed conflict. So any person not entitled to POW status, for example, would be entitled to civilian status irrespective of whether they fight. So the crucial point here in understanding the Fourth Convention is that the Fourth Convention extends to protect persons who fight, persons who are fighters 
The idea is not civilian in the targeting sense, and you'll hear more about that in a later panel, I'm sure. The idea here is a residual category is identified in the Fourth Geneva Convention, extending some measure of protection to persons who are affiliated with the enemy in the sense that they are a national of the enemy, even if nothing else, uh, and entitled to some measure of protection as a consequence who might be detained under this, uh, under this convention. Well, uh, any civilian may be detained where detention of that person is absolutely necessary for the security of the detaining power. So the standard here is absolute necessity. We have, in fact, a substantive standard, unlike the POW standard. If you fit within the definition of a prisoner of war, you're detainable. If you fit within the definition of civilian, you aren't necessarily detainable. You are detainable only where your detention is absolutely necessary for security reasons. That sounds like a robust standard, and in the abstract, it is a robust standard. But if we dig a little deeper into the understanding of the standard, um, we become sort of a little less uh, optimistic about the viability of the framework. So the ICRC commentary to Article 43 uh, of the Fourth Convention, one of the provisions in which the substantive standard for the detention of civilians is expressly identified. The commentary provides examples of persons who would clearly satisfy the standard. And these examples include persons who are suspected of being members of groups that are carrying out sab acts of sabotage. Uh, against the detaining authority. So multiple lever levels of attenuation in the definition. So suspecting that the person might be involved, suspecting that their involvement is membership in a group, and that it's the group carrying out the acts of violence against the detaining authority rather than the individual themselves. The idea here is that we have an absolute necessity standard, but the understanding of that standard, at least in 1949, uh, was that we have a very sort of broad notion of necessity here. Um, any person who might be connected in some way with the fighting uh, might be detained. And there are other examples that we can talk about more uh, in the Q&A broad substantive category. What procedures are required? There are procedural requirements in the Fourth Convention, but they're exceedingly modest. What's required? Uh, as soon as possible, there needs to be some review by a higher level authority determining whether the individual in question in fact satisfies the substantive standard, and it is required that there be periodic review uh, at least twice a year, ensuring that the detention of the person initially lawful continues to be necessary. So a review initially of the facts of the case, although that review may be administrative only and may be conducted wholly within the military, and periodic review uh, on an ongoing basis to determine whether or not detention uh, continues to be necessary as time goes forward. For how long uh, may these persons be detained in this scheme? Uh, for so long as the conditions justifying their, their detention obtain, but in no case uh, for longer than, or, or in no case beyond the close of general hostility. So the idea is for so long as they pose a threat, they can be detained uh, unless the conflict ends. Once the conflict ends, they must be released. Once they no longer pose a threat, they may be released. Once again, although here we have substantive limits, although here we have procedural requirements, although here we have some more robust endpoint uh, in the duration of detention, we nevertheless have, uh, I think, a fairly modest legal framework. Once again, this is a framework that applies only in time of international armed conflict, so we'd have to have uh, the nexus between a non-state actor and, and a state in the context of a state-to-state -state conflict. Third framework, much simpler, but by far the most important framework uh, in the context of conflicts with non-state actors. This is the framework provided in Common Article 3, uh, of the Geneva Conventions. This is the provision of the 1949 Geneva Conventions that governs non-international armed conflicts, a party structure concept, so conflicts between non-state actors or conflicts between states and non-state actors. Um, in the context of these conflicts, we have a minimum set of humanitarian protections provided in the Geneva Conventions, Common Article 3. What does Common Article 3 say about detention? Almost nothing. Detention is mentioned. It's quite plain that 
persons in the context of non-international armed conflict will likely be detained in a way that's connected to the conflict that's expressly contemplated by the provision. In fact, detention is one of the triggering conditions for the application of common Article 3. Who's protected by common Article 3? All persons that have not or are no longer taking any active part in hostilities. The provision provides examples of persons who are no longer taking active part in hostilities. One of the examples is persons who've been captured and are now detained. So in view of detention, they're entitled to protection in the provision. The provision otherwise says nothing about detention. We have no formal substantive limits. We have no procedural requirements. We might imply procedural requirements from the fact that the provision fundamentally requires humane treatment. We might suggest, and, and some authorities have suggested sensibly, it seems to me, that the requirement of humane treatment itself includes a requirement that persons not be subject to arbitrary detention, perhaps prolonged arbitrary detention would be the proper formulation. The idea is in the very notion of humane treatment, we might imply some substantive limits, procedural limits uh, on detention. But I underscore, those requirements would almost certainly rise only to the level of the protections recognized in human rights law and would go no further. Sort of the most, that would sort of be the, the gold standard. Insofar as we think those requirements are properly read into the notion of humane treatment, then those requirements are also included in the POW framework and the Civilians Convention framework, since both of those conventions and separate provisions require humane treatment as well. Last framework, uh, international human rights law. By many accounts, the gold standard um, on the substantive side and procedural side of detention, uh, although I'm skeptical. Uh, these rules apply at all times, uh, including in time of armed conflict, at least as a formal matter. Um, though the content of the rules might be qualified substantially through derogation regimes, Article 4, for instance, of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, so that in time of armed conflict, uh, these provisions might be watered down substantially, particularly with respect to detention. What persons may be detained in a human rights framework? What are the substantive limits? Well, there aren't formal substantive limitations on the authority to detain in human rights law, with the exception of Article 5 of the European Convention, which in fact expressly identifies the categories of persons um, detainable in a way that's consistent with the European Convention. The requirement in international human rights law is that persons not be made subject to arbitrary detention. So whatever substantive standard is adopted in the national law of the detaining state must be one that is non-arbitrary, which certainly implies that there are certain requirements. We might imagine that there are certain fairly modest requirements on the categories that would be identified uh, of detainable persons, but there is no um, formal substantive constraint on the categories of persons detainable. And it is quite plain, given the jurisprudence of human rights treaty bodies uh, and the relationship between international human rights law and humanitarian law, that persons who pose grave security threats are certainly detainable uh, in a way that's consistent with human rights law, even if we're exclusively confined to a human rights law framework. What are the procedural requirements? Well, uh, so to discuss this in a very watered-down way, we can take Article 9 of the ICCPR as an example. Uh, it's pretty plain that individuals would be entitled to notice of the grounds for their detention, some meaningful opportunity to rebut uh, those grounds for detention, and uh, review by some neutral, uh, some impartial tribunal. So notice an opportunity to rebut that's meaningful and review by an impartial tribunal, sort of the fundamental ingredients of the procedural scheme in international human rights law. I want to underscore, though, that these procedural requirements may be made subject to derogation in time of national emergency under Article 4 of the ICCPR. It's unclear uh, the extent to which these requirements, in fact, um, would be observed or are required to be observed uh, by international human rights law, once again, even if we're confined um, exclusively to that framework. For how long may these persons may be detained? There's no express rule here, um, but presumably the prohibition on arbitrary detention would require 
that persons not be detained any longer than the circumstances justifying their detention uh, obtain, a rule very similar to the Civilian Convention. So what do we make of these four uh, frameworks? There are a few comments that I want to make that sort of I hope will, will, uh, will frame our discussion going forward. First, uh, note that the available frameworks in the law of armed conflict are modest, um, modest on the substantive side, modest on the procedural side, likely inadequate uh, in the context of a prolonged armed conflict of the sort that the U.S. is engaged with, uh, with al-Qaeda. Second, international human rights law, the, the obvious alternative uh, or supplementary framework in international law, is also exceedingly modest. Uh, in fact, we might think it important to have both frameworks operating together, and it might be that we have to work out on the retail level how best to merge uh, an, a law of armed conflict framework with an international human rights law framework to come up with a durable, um, uh, sensible framework going forward. But the idea is human rights law alone, the idea that we might put to one side a law of armed conflict framework and allow other international law to do the work we'd like to see done, I think is, is an idea that we need to evaluate much more closely. The substantive and procedural limitations in human rights law are likewise modest. Third point I want to make. Uh, we shouldn't think that these frameworks are mutually exclusive. Uh, in fact, international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, when applicable, does not displace the application of international human rights law. It might qualify the application of human rights law in virtue of some features in international human rights law, the derogation scheme. It might, in fact, determine the meaning of some concepts in human rights law in the context uh, of armed conflicts. But we ought not think of these frameworks as alternatives that need be uh, sort of evaluated one or the other. They simply aren't mutually exclusive. The Geneva Conventions provide a floor, and it's obvious in the context of detention uh, that this floor may not be adequate, uh, but there's no reason in the world why we might not supplement that framework with human rights law in a way that's completely consistent with the existing frameworks. Uh, last point that I want to make, and this is a slightly odd point, um, but I, I want it to be out in the, in the ether as we, um, as we discuss these issues. You might be asking yourself why the law of armed conflict is so modest um, with respect to detention, and uh, particularly given that so many persons are made subject to detention in time of armed conflict, and particularly since so many conflicts are protracted, particularly since conflict is so common. Um, it's a fair question. But the idea here is that the law of armed conflict is really properly understood as a framework that is not designed to prevent detention in the main. In the main, it's a framework that provides warring parties with a viable, a viable framework for detaining rather than killing the enemy. Providing a viable framework for neutralizing the enemy, some framework that doesn't involve killing the enemy. Um, and in fact, many of the rules, it's pretty clear, take as their starting point the moment of detention. The Prisoner of War Convention requires that persons are pr prisoners, protects prisoners. The idea is not to outline a set of rules that limits who may be detained. The idea is to outline a scheme of treatment for persons who will predictably be made subject to the authority of the enemy. Same with Common Article 3. So we need to understand why these frameworks in the law of armed conflict are modest and in my view, uh, it underscores all the more the importance of supplementing those frameworks with human rights law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jinks. Now we'll turn to Professor Madeline Morris from Duke University School of Law. Thank you. Is that on or as on as it needs to be? Okay, thank you. I think that international law tells us less than Professor Jinks things it tells us, I think. It tells us that a state has a right to detain in self-defense against armed attack, and that that's not limited to armed attack by a state. If there's a right to use force, there's a right to detain. So that much seems pretty clear and unproblematic. Beyond that, though, I think we get less from law of war and even human rights law uh, 
uh, than, well, than comes anywhere close to providing an adequate framework. The Geneva Conventions, whether we're talking about the law of interstate armed conflict or law of non-international armed conflict, don't go to the critical question, as, as you've said, which is who can be detained? What's the definition of the class of people who can be detained? And what are the procedures for identifying that class? Beyond that, the end of the conflict is undefined for purposes of a conflict with al-Qaeda. That raises the question, should there be periodic review if there's continued detention? Should there be review of continued dangerousness? No address to that. No address, therefore, of course, to what the standards would be for such review. There's <clears throat> little that we can draw from that. If, I'm not sure if I understood you to say that everybody who's not a POW if captured is a protected person under the Civilians Convention. Is that? Not all. Per I mean, there are okay. some limits, okay. but um, there are some nationality constraints. But in but the main, international armed conflict. Yeah. Given that we're not told much by any interpretation of international law of war about who can be detained and how you would know, the questions about whether some minimal standards of human, humanitarian treatment apply really pale in comparison to the questions of who can you detain, for how long, how do you know, do you have to review for dangerousness, and so on. I think that those are the issues that are most pressing. What we do know clearly is that you can detain. What we don't know, it seems to me, is anything beside or beyond that virtually about who, how, when, for how long, and so on. US law, though, does provide constitutional parameters for the evaluation of preventive detention schemes. And preventive detention schemes exist in a wide range of contexts going to pretrial provisions, whether it's for material witnesses or for being held either without bail or for somebody who <coughs> can't make bail, in mental illness context where a person poses a danger to themselves or others, in context of contagious disease, and so on. But none of the contexts in which the US Supreme Court has already ruled on preventive detention regimes, in none of those contexts are the same dilemmas posed that we see in terms of detention in the counterterrorism context. Not in terms of duration or ability to identify. So if, if you look at the, a few of the regimes, if you look at, for example, bail, the duration issue is so circumscribed, the length of time for which a person would be preventively, preventively detained is so circumscribed by the upcoming trial that the concerns are lessened commensurately with that the limited period of time. For not to mention that the, the um, degree of check that's provided by the fact the person has to be uh, determined to some extent, at least beyond probable cause, to have been in, in fact responsible for a crime. But even leaving that aside, it seems to me what's happening there mostly in terms of the reduction of concern is the delimited time that that detention can go on. If you look at contagious disease, again, there are a set of constraining factors built in, like the ability to determine whether that person is a person with that contagious disease and an ability to determine subsequently whether the dangerousness continues. That is whether the person continues to have a contagious disease. So there's, again, a built-in set of limitations, much less so, though, with the context that I think is most analogous to counterterrorism detention, which is the mental illness context, where there isn't that kind of certitude about whether the person has a mental illness, whether that mental illness renders the person dangerous, whether at a subsequent point they remain dangerous, and so on. The treatment possibilities, again, are less clear than they would be with contagious disease. So in those ways, it's, I think, the most analogous of the existing preventive detention structures that have been 
ruled on in terms of their constitutionality. But they are different in the sense that there isn't the set of secrecy issues and the set of politicization issues that apply with regard to preventive detention in the counterterrorism context. So it's, it really sort of is the worst of all conceivable worlds in that you've got bad marks on all scores. You've got great difficulty in identifying in the initial determination whether this person is a combatant, as they've been called, or whether this person poses a threat of armed attack such that they would be detainable. Given the, the surreptitious nature of Al Qaeda or whatever particular offshoot or organization you're dealing with, the initial determination is terribly problematic. Treatment, again, analogizing to mental illness context, deradicalization programs are being developed in various countries with no particular um, systematicity and with no particular um, widely heralded results. So bad marks on that. Subsequent determinations of dangerousness, complete disaster. Duration, again, very problematic. No clear delimitation of a period of time. But then added to that, the problems of secrecy and to some extent appropriate secrecy regarding both the overall threat posed by terrorism as well as secrecy with regard to evidence relating to a particular detainee. And then added to that, the fact that the subject matter at issue is political. And therefore, the risk of abuse, of governmental abuse of this extraordinary power is at its height. So it's an area that's governed by existing constitutional law, but existing constitutional law doesn't go to the most critical aspects or some of the most critical aspects that make the counterterrorism detention context a very difficult one, very problematic one, even while the one thing we know is that, at least under international law, the overall proposition that you can detain individuals in some category defined in terms of a, a risk of armed attack is authorized. So, in fact, not only authorized, but recognized as inherent and what states will in any case do. So given that we don't get from existing international law or existing US law parameters that would regulate this highly problematic form of detention, which by hypothesis is, is going to continue, we were, I was encouraged here on May 21st last year in President Obama's archive <coughs> speech that while the administration intended to go forward with detentions, it sought to do so in conjunction with Congress and um, with judicial oversight as well as congressional oversight, as President Obama put it. That was last May. By July, the administration in their, uh, the government's brief in the Albahani case took the position that periodic review, which was part of what uh, the president had mentioned in the May 21st speech, periodic review with congressional and judicial oversight, that periodic review would be done, but exclusively at the discretion of the executive and unreviewable um, by any judicial process. That wasn't the position originally taken, but it was the position taken two months after the archive speech when it was becoming clear that there was going to be no legislation. So when the choice became one between executive lawmaking and judicial lawmaking without legislation, the government's position switched to, well, if, if it's going to be done that way, we'll do it. Uh, in, in the executive's unreviewable discretion. So that's the, the current position of the administration and a uh, position that was upheld by the D.C. Circuit in its decision in Albahani, which leaves us, it seems to me, in a terrible predicament. We're going forward with detentions, detentions that combine some of the most problematic governance issues that, that we could imagine if, if we sort of constructed the worst case scenario. And we're doing so 
in a context where <clears throat> there's really no regulating regime. There's no regulating regime that exists from international law. There's no legislated, regulated regime within US law. And whatever regime the executive may be applying from time to time uh, is not being presented in any coherent manner publicly and I fear is not much more coherent uh, privately. That's the current state of affairs. I don't know that it'll change because what's the, what's the congressional uh, incentive to, to take action? There, there's beyond even just the, the fear on ver from various parties within Congress that will end up with something worse than nothing. There's also on the level of individual members of Congress little obvious incentive to take on the issue at all. I mean, do you want to be the one who is against preventive detention or the one who's for preventive detention under these circumstances? The administration isn't expending capital on having legislation um, move forward on this subject. There was some attempt uh, prior to mid-July when the Bahani brief was filed, um, which was unsuccessful for all of the reasons of we may end up with something worse than nothing and we may end up with nothing at all. All of that has caused the administration to choose not to expend capital that's <coughs> been expended on other uh, legislative initiatives on a counterterrorism detention initiative, and the, there's no uh, impetus from within Congress that's going to go anywhere on this. And so that's where we're left on a, a terribly problematic issue that I assume will be spoken to by the court. I'm tempted to say the court that just overturned campaign finance, but I won't. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Professor Morris. Now we will go to, last but not least, uh, Professor Matthew Waxman from Columbia. Great, well, thank, thank you very much, and, and thanks for having me here. I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be at Duke, and especially thrilled to be on a panel with, uh, with Derek and Madeline, two uh, friends whose work I, I really admire. Uh, the, the title of my talk is the, the Structure of Terrorism Threats and the Law of Armed Conflict. And I think Madeline, in a brief conversation before uh, we started, helped me and boil it down to, to one sentence or two, and that is that the exercise we usually engage in as, as lawyers dealing with tough problems is to take some problem, some challenge, and figure out which box that problem goes into. Uh, uh, and sometimes it fits neatly into one box or another. Sometimes it requires creating a new box. Sometimes it requires taking an existing legal box and changing its contours a little bit to, to fit the problem. Uh, and, and, and the point of my talk is, is a, a, a methodological one about stepping back and, uh, and looking at the way in which we don't have agreement about what the it is that we're trying to stick into a box. Um, and look at some of the debates going on about the structure of current and future terrorism threats before we start thinking about how do we need to tinker with the box or, or choose among, among the boxes. Um, I, I, most debate about, scholarly debate, about the law of armed conflict as applied to terrorism threats uh, is focused on the degree to which al-Qaeda or, or other terrorism threats uh, do or don't uh, resemble in meaningful ways a traditional military threats carried out by, by, by armies. Uh, and where I think this debate has often fallen short is insufficient attention or integration of analytical developments within the counterterrorism community, including the intelligence community, uh, and especially some relevant specialized social sciences looking at the phenomenon of, 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 of terrorism. Uh, legal debate, uh, legal scholarly debate has tended to, to take a, a snapshot view of terrorism or, or, or to speak in terms of terrorism threats as a, a monolithic category without considering its, its diverse uh, subcategories or the way in which non-state threats may themselves be, be morphing in, 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 in important ways. Uh, and so to illustrate this methodological point, uh, I, I want to I want to focus on a, on a major dispute in the American and, and, and European counterterrorism analytical community, uh, and that is 
a, a debate about whether the primary terrorism threat to the United States and its, its, its Western allies uh, is posed by hierarchical, centralized terrorist organizations like al-Qaeda operating from geographic, territorial safe havens, uh, a, a problem uh, often referred to as a, a model of top-down terrorism threats championed by, by scholars like Bruce Hoffman, or is the primary threat uh, uh, posed by radicalized individuals conducting uh, loosely organized, ideologically common but operationally independent uh, 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 fights against Western societies, what's sometimes termed a, a bottom-up model of the terrorism threat championed by scholars like, like Mark Sageman. And while I think there's a broad consensus that both phenomenon, phenomena are of great concern and not neatly separable, uh, each view of the main terrorism threat poses uh, a different set of challenges to the laws of war. Uh, if the main terrorism threat to the United States and its allies uh, it reflects the former top-down model, top-down model, then I think existing law of war principles and rules are at least a useful starting point, uh, and perhaps with some modest reforms might be, might be built to as a, a box to fit the problem pretty well. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, the main terrorism threats are, are bottom-up, uh, then I think existing law of war rules and principles uh, are not only, uh, uh, not, not only have much less to offer, but according to proponents of, the, of, of this bottom-up assessment of, of future terrorism threats may be strategically counterproductive. Uh, and, and finally, if both threats, the top-down model and the bottom-up model, exist side by side, uh, then debates will need to focus on, on the boundary between the two, where, where, where the lines between the two should, should, should be drawn. So I think descriptively, uh, my main point would be that analysis about how the law of armed conflict might be evolving, uh, might, might be evolving already to deal with terrorism threats requires a, 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 a more nuanced and sophisticated examination of how terrorism threats themselves are, are evolving. Uh, and, 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 and normatively, my second point would be that the merits of any specific legal reform proposal uh, will depend heavily on the capacity of that proposal to meet strategic needs while balancing humanitarian liberty and, and conflict resolution interests. And that capacity, in turn, uh, to, to effectively balance those concerns depends on how well uh, the assumptions underlying those proposals accurately track anticipated future future terrorism threats. So, so let me illustrate that, that the, 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 those points with two, two examples. One, sort of a, a use ad bellum point, and the, and the second, a use in bellow point related to, to detention. Uh, with regard to use ad bellum, or, or the use of force, uh, I think many scholars and states would agree that non-state terrorist threats could give rise uh, to a right of armed self-defense, uh, that right of self-defense could include the authority to use force against terrorist targets or, or even against a, a harboring state. Uh, and the big debate is over what set of conditions give rise to that, to that right of self-defense. I think putting any of those theories uh, into practice, though, ought to depend heavily on a, on, on a clear understanding of the specific functional relationship between uh, the terrorism danger and the activity or non-activity um, of that quote, host state? Uh, what type of support, active or passive support, contributes significantly to the probability or, or intensity of the, of the terrorism threat? Uh, and here's where, where the debate about what the terrorism threat looks like becomes important. Because if one uh, is, is sort of a, uh, sees the terrorism threat from a, a top-down perspective, uh, believes the terrorism threats the, the, the major ones uh, come from territorial sanction, uh, sanctuaries that allow centralized or hierarchically uh, organized uh, uh, entities to plan, train, etc. cetera, uh, then even passive uh, uh, failure to eradicate terrorist havens uh, I think could more easily be viewed as a, a facilitating factor, perhaps suggesting that, that for, for example, allowing terrorists to operate from one's sovereign territory should be weighted heavily in a, in a self-defense use ad bellum analysis. Uh, if, on the other hand, though, uh, I, one believes that the territory and fixed bases um, are largely incidental to emerging terrorism threats, uh, the lethality of global terrorist networks or collection of networks as bottom-up 
uh, theorists of, uh, of terrorism threats do, then I think one would likely be skeptical that a state's failure to prevent violent extremists from operating within, within their borders uh, uh, should factor very significantly into, into a self-defense analysis. Uh, I think especially challenging here is, is, is a related problem of aggregation. Uh, uh, to the extent that a non-state actor conducts operations from a, a variety of, of, of geographically dispersed locales, what functional relationship among different entities um, ought to legally tie them together for the purposes of use ad bellum analysis. Uh, uh, at one end, uh, you might imagine the view that, that even common ideology among, among terrorist entities uh, ought to produce a, a, a view that, uh, that the right uh, uh, of self-defense against some of those ideologically allied entities uh, <coughs> creates a, a right of self-defense against all of them. Uh, instead, a, a more moderate position might be that, um, that in order to aggregate for the purposes of, of self-defense analysis, uh, I, different terrorist entities ought to, ought to be part of a single command structure. Um, uh, or maybe maybe we'd look to operational links, say exchanging information, common training, sharing resources, and ask whether those are sufficient uh, as a legal matter to to to, to aggregate to, uh, uh, for the purposes of of self defense uh, analysis. Uh, I think if if the law of war or if, or, or if the law of self defense, use ad bellum law, is fundamentally um, about responding to to actual or imminent threats then ultimately the answers to these theoretical questions ought to turn heavily on an empirical understanding of what is it about contemporary terrorist organizations that makes them so lethal, that makes them so threatening to the United States uh, uh, and, and, and its allies. And it's that sort of empirical understanding that's subject to, 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 to a raging debate within the, the, the counterterrorism community, within, with, within the political science community. Now, one might respond to this by saying that the top-down versus bottom-up debate is really a, a false choice, that, uh, that terrorist threats fitting either model coexist, and as do many threats in between. And, and, and I think that's right, uh, but that's in, in some ways precisely my, my, my point, that, that pegging any specific call for legal reform to some static prediction, st some snapshot view of the structure and operation of, of non-state groups, uh, I think re re uh, risks replacing uh, uh, a, a flexible legal approach um, with one suited to a, a particular but probably fleeting uh, vision of our strategic exigencies. And so while you know, easy application, that, that might, a, a, a specific set of rules about when uh, certain types of support for terrorism, for example, gives rise to a right of self-defense may, uh, some, 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 some bright line rules there might provide some, some clarity. Uh, my, my view is that, is that returning to some flexible uh, first principles of, of necessity and proportionality um, are ultimately likely to, to, uh, uh, to produce a more, a more stable legal regime over time uh, than trying to, to draw these kinds of, of bright line rules. Now, uh, I think similar issues arise in, in the use in bellow. Uh, uh, context, um, considering what are the appropriate outer bounds of military conduct uh, under, under the laws of war against a non-state terrorist organization. Um, and, and I'll use the example of detention, which this panel has been focused on. Uh, you know, again, I think many efforts uh, to answer these questions have tended to treat terrorism threats uh, uh, terrorism organ terrorist organizations as a monolithic category, uh, and, and this discussion ought to take a step back and try to understand more fully uh, the range of, of, of terrorism threats, the degree to which some of the key underlying assumptions of the law of armed conflict do or don't match the structural reality, the, the, the empirical reality of, 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 of emerging terrorism threats. Uh, uh, some of the, the, the specific rules of the laws of, of war, for example, in detention, derive from some generalizable features of warfare premised heavily on a hierarchically organized, uh, centrally commanded antagonist um, that exercises some control over its, o over its uh, constituent agents. Right? So for example, detention law, as we've heard, permits the capture and detention of enemy fighters for the duration of hostilities. That's because uh, until the end of hostilities, um, one could expect 
uh, that agents of, a, of an enemy power will be sent back to fight if, if released. On the other hand, when a war comes to an end uh, against a, a, a centralized, con centrally controlled hierarchical organization, you can expect reasonably that when the top of that organization makes a decision that the armed conflict, the war is over, uh, it's going to command uh, uh, its constituent agents, its fighters, to respect that decision. Uh, I, Concepts, though, of, of membership or, or on behalf of uh, an, an enemy organization, which are relatively easy uh, to apply in conventional warfare uh, and might be straightforwardly analogized in a conflict against a non-state terrorist actor that shares those attributes of unified command, that, that's sort of the easy case. It's, it's when those basic assumptions about centralized command, hierarchical organization break down that the balances struck by the laws of war also begin to fray. Uh, uh, so I think, for example, uh, I, you know, how, how one thinks we ought to change detention rules uh, for the purposes of combating terrorism threats depends, again, on whether you see the problem more from a top-down perspective. Where, uh, uh, where, where you see al-Qaeda or other terrorist enemies as, as analogous to an army that could be defeated um, in, some, in some meaningful sense, where you could see an, a, 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 an end to cessation of, of, of hostilities. And again, political scientists have been doing a lot of work over recent years on the question of how, of, of how terrorist groups end, how conflicts with terrorist organizations do sometimes come to Got come to an end. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you believe that contemporary terrorist threats resemble more the sort of bottom-up model of loosely organized, loosely affiliated, perhaps ideologically unified, but organizationally distinct subunits, um, then, uh, then traditional de detention rules, I think, don't provide very much guidance. Uh, one, one, one alternative uh, that's been explored, for example, by, by Duke's Professor Bradley would be to, to begin to look at a concept like end of hostilities on an individual basis. Uh, uh, and set up mechanisms to assess whether a war has essentially come to an end with regard to a particular detained individual rather than when it's come to an end with regard to, 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 its, to its group. Uh, so, so let me just conclude by saying you know, the, the, the point of my talk, which I, I said was a, really a methodological one, uh, is not to provide uh, uh, any specific answers to, to questions arising out of this how, you know, how do we adapt the law of armed conflict to, to, to non-state terrorist threats, but rather to, to reorient the discussion a bit uh, uh, about legal adaptation in terms of some important debates uh, about what the, threat, the future threat environment that we're trying to deal with even looks like. Um, and I think that's a, a prior question. Uh, uh, because there are these competing yet coexisting uh, bottom-up versus top-down terrorism threats or models of terrorism threats, and because terrorist organizations are themselves uh, uh, mutating, evolving, uh, my own view is that rather than trying to construct law, law of war rules um, that are universally applicable to terrorist threats, uh, uh, the goal ought to be a more context-sensitive uh, uh, legal adjustments that take account of the multiple structural uh, uh, organizations of, of, of terrorism threats. On the one hand, uh, you know, I think the need to incorporate legal anal in into this legal analysis uh, a, a sophisticated understanding uh, or appreciation of, of, of terrorist organization and evolution means that the legal process or the, or, or the process of legal ad adaptation will be frustratingly slow. It'll be frustratingly slow. Uh, on the other hand, though, uh, I think doing so, uh, waiting uh, and, and engaging in a more context-specific analysis uh, is ultimately likely to produce a better fit uh, between law and, and strategic necessity in ways that, that will pr provide a, a sustainable balance between, between those strategic necessities, military necessities, and humanitarian or, or liberty values. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Waxman. And I would like to thank all of our uh, speakers for staying roughly within the time limits. I, I tell you, coming from the political science world uh, into the, the legal world, the difference is that Legal scholars actually respect rules and law, and <laughs> thus they obey time constraints. Uh, political science speakers, it's like operating in a, in a Hobbesian world of anarchy and 
The, the only thing that you can get them to stop speaking is, is force or the threat of force uh, to get them to stop talking. Uh, so we have roughly 25, 30 minutes uh, to, to have further discussion in Q&A. I just want to get the ball rolling uh, by throwing out a few questions, uh, relying on my uh, comparative advantage in coming from the social sciences and political sciences uh, rather than uh, law. I'm going to rely more on, on you out there who are more specialists in law than I. Um, so in the spirit of interdisciplinarity, let me throw a few uh, curveballs that might be uh, that things that came up for me. And so the sort of three questions I wanted to ask. Um, first uh, is about historical precedents for detention so, and whether there are any lessons for institutional design, implementation, and effectiveness. So uh, international lawyers confronted with, with a question like this go to the relevant international and domestic law. And we heard, we heard a fair bit about that. Social scientists sort of go to history, what might be called precedent. Um, as, as a social scientist, right, one of the first questions that occurs to me on this, question, on this issue of detention is, what are the historical cases out there uh, where this, the type of detention sort of under consideration or under discussion here has been implemented? So some cases that came to mind were uh, the British in, in Northern Ireland, I think it was in the 1970s, who implemented a kind of uh, uh, fairly broad detention practice. Uh, what has been the experience of the Israelis in this, in this issue? Have there been other democracies confronted with domestic terror uh, uh, challenges or threats that have reacted uh, in this way? Uh, what did they try? What practices did they try? What happened? Uh, what was their experience? Was it effective? Uh, what can we learn from it potentially for, for this issue? Or are we in a completely, is the situation so different? Are we in such a completely different ballgame that, uh, it's, that it's very difficult to draw any comparisons or lessons uh, from previous experiences uh, in this regard? Second question is kind of related, um, <clears throat> and it's th these debates about, about detention and other practices in counterterrorism, uh, like targeted killings, for example, which has been a lot of debate uh, some recent articles in the, in the National Journal, the Diane Rehm show yesterday uh, was all about this. Um, it kind of take place in a vacuum. Uh, many of the measures contemplated or discussed in counterterrorism are very similar to those being discussed and used in, in counterinsurgency. Um, and the, the two often don't seem to, to come together perhaps as much as they should. I mean, some of the issues are very similar. To win over the population, isolate insurgents slash terrorists from the, from the people, uh, <coughs> making them easier to defeat. Um, what lessons do you think can be gleaned from counterinsurgency theory and practice about what might work versus what might not work uh, in detention policy? And one thing I would, I would throw out is there's uh, uh, students of violence talk about selective versus indiscriminate forms of, of violence. You could use the same selective versus indiscriminate forms of detention. Um, selective being more effective than indiscriminate. Um, uh, what's the potential uh, to generate uh, new recruits versus, uh, or more sympathy for the cause but while eliminating leaders so you're attacking the group from the top but perhaps generating more support going into the bottom uh, by the practices you're using. So what, what, what if any uh, uh, lessons can be drawn from counterinsurgency? And then last, this is, this is more for Professor Waxman but please uh, any of the, of the panelists uh, should feel free uh, to respond. Um, and this is because of your specific background in, in study of coercion. I was wondering about whether you could apply lessons from your study of coercion in interstate uh, contexts to coercion by states against sort of transnational uh, non-state actors like Al-Qaeda. Um, specifically, what is the potential uh, of detention of terrorists uh, to defeat uh, these kinds of threats? We often speak in this regard uh, as if killing terrorists uh, is the benchmark of success, right? So we read uh, in, in an article that we've, we've killed 14 out of the top 20 Al-Qaeda officials in, in Pakistan, uh, which is reminiscent of the debate in strategic bombing about, well, we're destroying lots and lots of targets, but what's our theory of how destroying targets uh, gives us coercive leverage, right? Um, so how is detention sort of part of an integrated strategy uh, to reduce terrorist attacks or defeat or get rid of such groups uh, entirely. So I throw those uh, questions out to you.
uh, feel free to, to respond, and then we'll uh, take questions from the audience. And I guess I'll, I'll take the, uh, the questions. Oh, oh, let me um, just make, make one comment offhand before coming back to some of the, you know, the broader points about law and strategy. Uh, we're, we're lucky here that um, we have Professor Benveniste from, from, from Israel who knows more than anybody in the world about the Israeli detention law. Uh, so, so we'll probably have a, an opportunity to, to hear it a, a, a bit more later. One of the things, though, that, 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 that I've always been impressed with from, from my study of, of Israeli detention law is, is the following. Uh, I think, I think the, the Bush administration made um, uh, a, generally a, a strategic error in saying that uh, – we are. I, I think it was. It, it made the reasonable argument we are in an armed conflict with Al Qaeda. This is one, an argument that the uh, that the Obama administration has also embraced, as have the other branches of government, uh, uh, and therefore the president has some authority to detain under the laws of war. Uh, then, though, going to some of these secondary questions that that both Derek and Madeline asked, questions like, well, if we're in this box of the law of armed conflict, what rules does it apply, does it demand, especially on procedural questions? Um, and the answer was generally, well, not much, because the procedural questions throughout most of the conventional warfare out of which detention law grew didn't really have to con confront these kinds of questions to the same degree. So the Bush administration took this uh, as uh, quite a bit of license in saying that because the laws of war don't provide, especially for unlawful combatants, much in the way of, 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 of rules and standards for procedures, um, there aren't really any, it's, it, it largely boils down to executive branch discretion of what standard of certainty, what kinds of, of procedures, what kind of access, an ability to uh, a contest detention ought to be provided to, to, to detainees. And, and I think part of what was driving that was a desire for maximum flexibility. But I think also there, there was sort of this, this um, legal philosophical view within some in, 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 in the Bush administration that uh, if you're in the area, the zone of the laws of war. If we're in, in an armed conflict, in, in war, and therefore the law of armed conflict is our legal framework, that that is fundamentally, inherently incompatible with things like judicial review, with, 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 uh, with legislative standards, with review by uh, independent judges, et cetera. Uh, and I, th I think what the Israeli model has done much better in, in its various detention law schemes is, is, uh, is develop essentially a hybrid that ad adopts a, a law of war framework that says that it, 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 this, a state can be at war with an, an, age, an, 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 an entity like Hezbollah, can capture and hold enemy fighters as part of the law of, of war, but that view is fully compatible with, uh, with notions of, with, with practices like judicial review, and in fact, is going to be more strategically successful if merged with, uh, with judicial review and if sen sensible rules and standards built for this particular type of conflict are legislated and, 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 and formalized. Uh, and so if, in, in my mind, that's both a, a, a lesson, a sort of a, a comparative insight from, from the Israeli case, and also I think gets to, to, to your point about the integration of, of law and strategy, that, uh, that flexibility to neutralize enemy fighters is but one very narrow military or strategic interest. Uh, uh, issues of legitimacy, uh, combating extremism, uh, reputational impact, uh, the strength of, of your relationships with coalition partners and allies, which often turns on, 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 on have, have reaching agreement on legal issues, those are all also critically important from a strategic standpoint. Yeah, I'll just offer a couple of uh, comments on these questions. Um, First, I think it's incredibly difficult to assess historical examples. Um, you know, if, if we agreed on the criteria that we might use to determine 
which practices, which historical practices um, were effective or successes, we'd likely agree on many of the aspects of a detention policy moving forward. So um, was the British detention policy in Northern Ireland successful? Um, by what metric? Um, if we view it exclusively through a civil liberties framework, a human rights framework, the answer I'd submit is unequivocally no. Um, if we ask whether the detention policy contributed in some way to um, successful resolution of the conflict, I think that would be an incredibly difficult empirical question to sort out. But even if so, it might be um, as part of an overall coercion strategy, for instance. Uh, even if so, it's unclear whether that ought to be the only um, metric by which we make these assessments. And in fact, if we thought it were the only metric, uh, we'd have answers to many of our mo most important questions that we have at the moment. So one historical example, for instance, that's oftentimes tossed around in these debates uh, concerns judicial review. So the United States in World War II detained over 400,000 German POWs on U.S. soil uh, with a grand total of zero um, uh, habeas petitions uh, entertained on behalf of those prisoners. Um, what ought we make of that historical example? Does it suggest that viable, fundamentally fair, humane detention frameworks are possible only in the law of armed conflict, maybe even more broadly under international law, without any resort to judicial review, and history establishes it, because we had an effective framework in World War II, um, depends on the, the lens by which we would evaluate that framework. Second point um, is that it's incredibly difficult to make to, to, to draw uh, examples from history regarding common Article III frame, frameworks since states have uh, traditionally denied the applicability of the framework. So um, we have very little in the way of uh, sort of historical examples of a detention framework in a long-term non-international armed conflict motivated by common Article III, with common Article III being adopted as a good faith um, Guidepost for what you know what the, what the fundamental features of a detention framework ought to be. Last point: um, there are plenty of of sort of contemporary historical examples from which we might learn things, and we have a, a panel later today on comparative approaches, uh, and Israel is but one of those examples. I submit, though, that um, really the problems that that Israel is facing in these contexts, the problems that other democracies are facing in this context track very closely the problems that the United States is facing. I'm not, um, is Israeli detention policy regarding unlawful enemy combatants a success? Well, if so, uh, then perhaps the United States policy is also a success um, uh, by, when evaluated through the same sorts of, um, uh, by the same sort of standards. I think it's incredibly difficult to draw um, lessons from contemporary history. The last point I'll make regards counterinsurgency. I'm just not sure that counterinsurgency theory or lessons that have been gleaned from counterinsurgencies will prove terrifically helpful here because I, I think, I hope, that we've moved beyond the point at which that literature ends. Um, what do we know, just to sort of encapsulate it in a you know, sort of breathtakingly crude formulation, um, brutality and inhumanity is strategically, operationally, tactically unwise in counterinsurgencies in the main. Um, let's hope that we're beyond the point of contemplating brutality, inhumanity, um, indiscriminate approaches uh, in counterterrorism detention. So I think we're already, in a way, once we're talking about which legal framework we ought to adopt, we are, in a sense, uh, aligning with one side in approaches that one might take to counterinsurgency. And as a consequence, the lessons that we glean from those examples are likely to prove um, not as useful as they might be maybe in 2001 or 2002. Did you want to? Just to <clears throat> ask a question that's half rhetorical and half not, and in response to the comparison with other countries historically, including contemporary history, which is the question, where are the prisoners taken by other coalition countries? If we don't have an answer to that question, I don't know how we can compare in a meaningful way. 
contemporary history. So there's simply no analogs. Well, I think that there are analogs, and they have to do with giving prisoners to other countries. Either there's a no prisoner policy, which I assume would not be the case, or they're going somewhere. Okay. Let's uh, turn in the time remaining to some questions here in the gray sweater, please. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, the question I have for the panel is, um, given the difficulties that we're encountering in applying the law of armed conflict to the question of uh, detention, and in particular context of what we've conceptualized rising in some of the, the solutions that we're uh, uh, creating. I mean, Professor Morris mentioned the, the issue of dealing with, with doubt in contexts where um, preventative detention may be imposed and the analogs may be uh, you know, uh, physical or mental illness, uh, questions that are sort of objectively verifiable. But the problem is obviously that now we're dealing with uh, a question that's not so objectively verifiable. Will this person at some point in the future become dangerous or have they been already? That's the kind of question that we are used to entrusting to a jury, to a jury of you know, 12 or, or fewer uh, people, as it may be. Um, also, this, this issue of you know, uh, defining the scope of the authority to detain a prisoner of war uh, based on the uh, duration of a war against an individual. I think that that's, a, that's an, an interesting accommodation of um, the problems that we're dealing with in, in, in this particular context with the law of armed conflict. But I think that the kind of um, sort of intellectual difficulty that that, that, that comprises and the kind of um, challenge that that creates in uh, conceptualizing a, a war as something that can be inflicted against an individual may be indicating to us that, in fact, armed conflict isn't exactly the right paradigm to be using. That, in fact, what we should be looking at this as is a problem of international law enforcement. And this is a, uh, a problem that we should be dealing through our criminal justice system that we, and, I think it's also on the question of history, it's interesting that we do in our, our history in the United States have precedents in which we have dealt consistently with terrorism as a criminal justice issue, even in cases where the scope of violence have been, has been massive, where the opponent has been well armed. Um, I think at the late 19th century, the Reconstruction period with the, the Ku Klux Klan uh, in, in this very part of the country threatening the, the stability of the new union, uh, the, the, the mechanism that was used to, to defeat that was in, to some extent, armed occupation, but was also what, what was very dispositive, I think the, the scholarship shows, is the Department of Justice's activity in civilian courts to secure prosecutions of these individuals. So I, I just, I, I, I think that the difficulties that we're having with this problem are owed to the fact that we are inheriting a paradigm from the last administration about how we're going to deal with this problem, and that we're constrained by that paradigm, and we should be looking outside of it. That's, that's my humble <laughs> opinion on the, on the question. Yeah, to, to clarify a couple of things, I mean, certainly I'm not suggesting that either war or crime are the appropriate paradigm, and don't think that either one alone is. Um, and I think that getting stuck as, in that as a, a choice is a false choice, that in fact, we, what we find from international law is, and not even from law of war specifically, but from international law is an inherent right to use force, including detention, in self-defense against armed attack. So that's out there. That, that's a basis for detention, not necessarily as law of war specific. The, Question then is, in accordance with what body of law? My point would be not in accordance with an existing, already developed body of law, criminal or law of war. In terms of the question of certainty, or rather uncertainty, we deal with uncertainty in preventive detention contexts a lot. In mental illness, for example, the idea that we can not only determine whether someone is mentally ill, which is problematic enough, but also whether they pose a danger to themselves or others, which is the other part of the uh, standard, is enormously and famously uh, problematic. But yet it's not given to a jury to determine. It's a, a civil proceeding and reviewable, to be sure, as I think any uh, 
preventive detention uh, proceedings should be and decisions should be. But in many contexts, bail, the same thing, the, the risk of flight. We're predicting whether somebody's likely to do something in the future that we don't like, that would be harmful. So we, we do in, and, and again, that's not a criminal um, proceeding, although it takes place within a criminal context. The, um, <clears throat> the part about the preventive detention is civil, non-criminal, predictive in a, in a lax, uh, not lax procedurally necessarily, but necessarily in an inaccurate way in many cases. And I don't think that the, the criminal justice um, set of tools is appropriate for certain kinds of terrorist threat that will either result in erosion of criminal law, where you're expanding the available tools within criminal law through statutes like the material support statute that go beyond attempt and beyond pre-existing standards, uh, inviting juries to apply versions of reasonable doubt that are doubtful, um, or you, you have to, to move to another model, and I don't think that model is law for either. Um, in, in terms of the, the KKK and, and Reconstruction and the role of courts, don't forget habeas was also suspended in response to KKK activities during that uh, period. So that's right. So it's the, the suspension of habeas in earlier times was a response to domestic versions and, and earlier technology versions of threat that could be encompassed within invasion or rebellion, because the person had to be here to pose that kind of threat. Where that's not true anymore, Detention becomes analogous to a suspension of habeas in ways that are not direct but are significant. And I think that the, the um, suspension of habeas relative to the Klan is, uh, is particularly significant because it would be hard to constitute it very properly as an invasion or rebellion, but yet that's what happened. Whether it was, should have happened or not is another question. But. The only thing that I would add, just a couple of points. Um, first, I don't think it's I don't think it's um, productive or accurate to think of these uh, frameworks as competing paradigms. I mean, you say that um, the conflict or armed conflict framework is constraining. Um, in my view, that's based on the idea that it's constraining is based on a misconception of the law of armed conflict. In my view, we ought to think of the law of armed conflict is articulating a floor. Um, we shouldn't think of the framework as providing uh, a ceiling as well. It's even a mistake, and, and I think sort of manifestly so. It's a mistake to think that the law of armed conflict actually authorizes, in some you know, thick sense, um, authorizes coercive action to be taken against anyone. I mean, the fact that the law of armed conflict um, operates with an assumption of the equality of the belligerents, uh, making no judgment about whether either side is in fact entitled under international law or any normative or legal framework to participate in the fight makes clear that the framework really shouldn't in any way be understood as a framework that displaces other frameworks. I mean, a state could unilaterally engage in some manifestly unlawful act and as a consequence confer on itself some authority to take coercive action against the, even the citizens of other states, perverse framework if thought of as anything other than a floor. If it's a floor, it's useful, um, but maybe only a starting point in conflicts like this one. Second point is, even if there were, uh, even if these frameworks were properly understood to be a competing framework, a uh, competing paradigms, it's important to understand that we don't really seem to have a legal principle in international law, or to my knowledge, even constitutional law, that would compel choosing one framework or the other. We're making policy judgments about which paradigm we'd want. To, well, if we agreed on the values that we wanted to maximize in making that policy judgment, I wouldn't think that we'd, I don't think we'd be so concerned about the idea that there are competing paradigms in the first place. Your question is sort of motivated by um, a, a privileging of the liberty or freedom side and a sort of de-emphasizing the security concerns that are specific to this conflict. Many others wouldn't 
approach the policy uh, question in those ways. If we don't have a legal principle that compels choosing one paradigm or the other, it's yet another way in which conceptualizing this as competing paradigms is a dead end. Um, what we're likely to have to do is recognize that we're in a policy framework <coughs> with competing values that uh, need to be maximized to varying extents, um, and fashion, drawing on the law of armed conflict, drawing on human rights law, drawing on constitutional law, principles that are relevant here, perhaps relying more on standards than rules for the, the sort of reasoning uh, that Matt provides. But I'd, I'd want to push back on sort of the way that you formulated your inquiry from the, from the get-go. And we, we could talk about it further, but it's, it's a terrifically important point. I just think it's the wrong way to think about the choices we face. And if, if I could just add, um, you know, I think it's interesting. I, I think when President Obama came into office, I think there was a, a hope both at home and abroad that he was going to abandon the sort of the war paradigm to combating terrorism. Uh, uh, and one thing that's been interesting is not only has the Obama administration embraced it, but in some ways even hardened it. There's a, a really interesting document you could find on the White House website in response to some criticism from, from Dick Cheney about not taking the war on terror seriously, where, where the, it's a statement from the White House saying, actually, we take it more seriously than the Bush administration. They talked kind of generically about this loosey-goosey war on terror, we mean it when we say we're in an armed conflict with al-Qaeda, and that's why our attorney general has said so, and secretary of defense, and all sort of down the line. Uh, uh, and just in, in today's news, you'll see some, some interesting stories about how, uh, having reviewed the detainee files at Guantanamo, uh, uh, the administration has concluded that about 50 detainees at Guantanamo are likely to go into this category of too dangerous to release but can't be prosecuted. Um, that doesn't include about another 30 Yemeni detainees who probably aren't going to be transferred anytime soon. So even just at Guantanamo, uh, I, the Obama administration has sort of tentatively concluded that you know close to 100 detainees may be detained under the law of war uh, with or need to be uh, for imperative reasons of security without without prosecution I just make one last point which is uh, the a law of war approach to counterterrorism counter al-qaeda operations sweeps much more broadly than just detention um, and if you're worried about detention uh, under some standards lower than beyond reasonable doubt without juries and judges. The problem you should be really interested in is targeted killing, predator drones, et cetera. Um, because I assure you, well, I, by all credible reports, they've increased since Obama has come into office. And I assure you the standard employed um, without the transparency of detention operations in, in, in lethal operations is not beyond reasonable doubt. And I assure you there's no judicial review. Um, uh, that's without knowing the details, but I'm just 100% <laughs> confident of that part. Um, uh, uh, so anyway. Uh, Great. Given that we started a little late, I've been uh, allotted some extra time from the, the powers that be uh, for more questions. If there are more questions, please uh, state them briefly and address them to one of one of the speakers in particular. Yes, sir. I don't want to take time from the students. <laughs> they don't I seem to be. I have a targeted question. <laughs> so, uh, Derek, um, yeah, I, agree, I agree completely with your point that in an area where non-state actors uh, really don't fit neatly into uh, international humanitarian law or rights law, that really the answer is probably to try to meld the two of them. Uh, the one thing that I was very surprised that you mentioned, maybe just because of lack of time, is, of course, the historic position of the United States for, for 50 years since the beginning of the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is that it doesn't apply outside the United States. So that uh, in the plain text of the treaty uh, states it applies in our territory and subject to our jurisdiction. This is actually Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, the great negotiator of the treaty, held firm on that position, you know, right or wrong, and it has been the position of the United States, which we've defended for 50 years, that you know, if we are detaining people outside the United States, uh, it, it doesn't apply. And you know, arguments say, even the title of it, civil and political rights, you know, really implies how we treat our own citizens who are part of a, a civic pop, uh, population. So 
uh, are you suggesting that uh, it, just as a policy matter that we might want to draw from uh, human rights law, with which I actually agree, or, or are you actually suggesting that contrary to the long-standing position of the United States, that it in fact actually does apply uh, to detentions that we have outside the United States? I was suggesting that only as a policy matter. It, I think this is another important limitation. I was focusing more on sort of the the substantive and, and, and procedural limitations in human rights law to underscore some of its weaknesses. But this is another weakness. The scope of application um, is, is a weakness. In fact, even if we move outside of the ICCPR context, which has the territorial limitation, um, arguably has the territorial limitation, um, even if we only have a jurisdiction or within the jurisdiction limitation, a la the European Convention, then there are many acts, most prominently targeting, that take place extraterritorially in time of armed conflict that would be ungoverned by human rights law, even by this much broader understanding of the circumstances in which the obligations are applicable. So it's yet another limitation on the framework when applied de jure, um, and a terrifically robust one. From the US perspective, this territorial limitation is decisive when we talk about armed conflicts, because we simply don't think about armed conflicts taking place in the United States. Of course, from the perspective of many states, many actors, this territorial limitation, they have a much odder, uh, much more nuanced sort of relationship to that limitation since it's far more likely that conflict would take place on their territory. Um, but I won't delve into the merits of the US position. I think the historical point that you make is an important one. Um, the US did make the case. In fact, it is the reason why the territorial language is included in Article Two of the ICCPR. Um, there are some very complex progressions that we might walk through to offer alternative explanations about why that, why that language is there. It's quite obvious that the most straightforward explanation is that the US wanted to supplement the jurisdictional limitation with the territorial limitation. It was made plain, and it's been the US position ever since. Important, um, but on the whole, I think consistent with, um, with the thrust of my remarks, which is sort of this idea that we ought to abandon the law of armed conflict or uh, qualify substantially its usefulness in this context because we ought to instead rely on human rights law, that that's the wrong way to think about this. And this is yet another reason why that's so. Any final questions for our panelists? OK, well then please uh, join me in thanking them for getting us off to a terrific start. <laughs>